What's up everyone, welcome back to the channel and to another weekly 3D model. This week we're going to be making a trucker radio, or rather a CB radio. So a lot of people have been asking me to create a game ready model, so that's exactly what we're going to be doing in this week's video. What exactly do I mean by game ready? Well, that usually just means having one optimized lower poly mesh that you can use in your game engine, and a higher poly mesh that you can texture on to create your texture maps. Now there are many factors that come into play when creating a video game asset, like how it's going to be used, background versus foreground prop, which game engine it's going to be used in, and many other factors, and all of these questions are important to know when creating your models for performance reasons. Unfortunately, we can't have a billion polys and a hundred textures because it's all being rendered in real time. So to make this a little bit more realistic, I thought we should add some restrictions for ourselves like we would if we were actually making this for a video game. So we're going to try to keep this thing under 10k polys and use only one texture map. We got a lot of work to do, so let's just dive into it. First thing on our list is finding reference. So I jumped on Amazon and to keep things very simple, we are going to grab the first one on our list. Lucky for us, this one provides us with measurements and a front orthographic view we can use to size our buttons. So I quickly downloaded those images onto my computer and I jumped back into Maya to start blocking things out. Oh, and really quickly, as always, this whole video will be available in real time along with all of the working files like the FBX model and the Substance Painter file. So if you want access to any of those, they will all be available on my Patreon page, which you can find the link in the description below. So first thing to do in Maya is to make sure our scene is sized correctly. So at the top under Windows, Settings, Preferences, and then under Preferences, we can go down to Settings and make sure our linear measurements are set to centimeters. We can then go ahead and create a cube in Maya and size it to the measurements provided in our Amazon ad. The ad provides us with millimeter measurements, so with a quick measurement converter Google search, I can find the centimeter measurements and plug those into the scale X, Y, and Z in the channel box in Maya. Now that we have the rough size of our CB radio blocked out, we can then go to the front view and import that orthographic image that we took from our Amazon ad that shows us all the buttons. This will help us quickly block out our buttons without having to guess all of the proportions. While clicking on the image plane, under display, I'm going to set looking through camera to front. That way we can only see the image plane in the front camera view, and it's going to be easier to work on the mesh in the perspective camera view. Now that everything is set up correctly, we can start blocking out our low poly model. So the first thing we're going to do is add an edge loop to our rectangle. If you look at our Amazon ad, you can see how there's two separate panels or two pieces. There's a front panel piece and then a second in the back and they're two different colors and we want to separate these two from one another. So by adding an edge loop, I can select all of those faces and using the extract tool, I can separate those faces from this object. So now we have two separate pieces to work with. And then I'm going to add a few edge loops and do the same thing for the front screen. So switching over to the front camera view, I can use that image plane we use as some sort of guide and I can add some edge loops to block out that screen. And then once again using the extract tool, I can separate it from my mesh. Then I'm going to start blocking out all my buttons. So all I'm going to do for this is insert a cylinder, I can reduce those divisions to make it lower in polys, and I can just align that up with my reference photo. And once again, I'm going to use that extract tool to highlight half of my faces on my cylinder. I can extract it to separate it and I can drag that over to size my button correctly. And once the size is looking correct, I can then combine those two pieces back into one object and double click those edges to bridge them back together. And then all I have to do is just keep duplicating the same button to create all my other buttons in my scene. And of course, if you did want to cut back on even more polys in your scene, I would start off with an even lower poly cylinder for your buttons. So one thing that I'm going to do to save myself a ton of time down the road when we create our high poly mesh is once I have those main cylinders blocked out for all of our knobs, I'm just going to duplicate them once and hide them in our scene so I can use them later on to boolean out some holes in a high poly mesh. Since all those cylinders are already positioned correctly, it's just going to save me a lot of time down the road. All right, so now that all of our buttons are blocked out, next on the list is that metal piece that attaches itself to the box. I think it just helps attach itself onto the dash of the truck. So what we're gonna do for this is create a small plane and I can block out roughly what that shape looks like. Now, originally I did say we're not gonna add any bevels, but because of this is a pretty big bevel, we are gonna add one small bevel to it. One on the top 
and a few other small bevels on the bottom corners. But like I said, we want to keep those very small bevels so we don't increase the polys too much. And lucky for us, it does show the thickness of this piece in our reference photo. So I will use that reference to help show how thick this piece of metal should be. And once I have half of the shape complete, I can duplicate it over to create the other side, combine them into one object and bridge those two edges back together. All right, so next on the list were those small knobs on the side. Now I'm not gonna worry too much about getting everything perfect to a reference photo. I just wanna roughly block out a knob. So all I'm gonna do for this is just create another cylinder. We can align that to our reference photo. I can select some of those outside faces and extrude them outwards to create that knob-like look. Now, once again, we're gonna keep this thing fairly low in polys. We're gonna create all the bevels later on in our high poly mesh to create that curvature. So for now, let's just keep it nice and blocked out. All right, so next up was the screen. Now there are a few ways you could have approached this. Now what I decided to do was add some edge loops so I can block out using that reference image all of those squares. That way it would make my life extremely easy when we jump into Substance Painter to apply those materials to those see-through little boxes and squares on the screen. Now, of course, you don't have to add any edge loops. In fact, this is one area I would definitely cut back if I needed to reduce more polys. The whole screen could just be one simple plane without any polys on there. And then in Substance Painter, you can just add those see-through boxes directly onto the mesh, into the textures, and you don't need really any edge loops. Now, the only reason why I did this was just to save time on the texturing. I knew later on in Substance using the UV chunk fill, I could just quickly assign those materials to those boxes, and I wouldn't have to worry about aligning them correctly or making it look accurate to my reference. I could just use the reference to block it out with edge loops and assign those materials very, very quickly. So I wanted to make a quick note of that. This is definitely one area that you can reduce polys if needed. All right, so if you look at the back box of our CB radio, it looks like there's two metal pieces. There's a top piece and a bottom piece with that seam that runs on the side. And we don't want to separate these two into two pieces. It would just add more polys. So what we're going to do is just add one edge loop. That way I can add some bump later on in Substance Painter. And then we can also use this edge loop to separate these two pieces and add a nice bump into our higher poly mesh. So we're just going to add one edge loop as almost a placeholder. All right, so as you can see, I moved on to the back panel of my CB radio. And once again, using that extract tool, I just selected those back faces and I separated them from my mesh. And then once again, using some cylinders, I can start blocking out those buttons or those little outlets on the back of my radio. Now I definitely simplified the back of this object. It's not gonna be exact to our reference photo we see on Amazon. I just used some random references from different CB radios just to simplify a lot of these shapes. So if you look at the reference, there are two large holes where the vertical sliding buttons are. So we're gonna create some small booleans for those holes. I'm going to fake the other holes on the model, but since these holes are larger and more obvious, I thought we could add those directly into the geometry. Now this is important to note depending on which game engine your model is being used in and how your model will be used, it can drastically change how you approach your modeling. For example, a background prop versus a main character prop, so keep that in mind when making your models, you can fake a lot of the details if needed to save on a lot of polys. And we will be doing that with this mesh, but like I said, I still wanted to add some details, so I thought adding those small booleans would be okay for this model. So since those booleans are the same size as my buttons, I'm just gonna duplicate my buttons, combine them into one mesh, and I can boolean out some small holes. And then once those booleans are made, I can go ahead with the target weld tool and the multi-cut tool and clean up some of the topology just to attach those vertices. And don't worry, triangles are okay around booleans. This piece of plastic or metal is not being animated or bent, so those triangles are not going to warp the geometry at all. Mm -hmm. 
All right, so now that we have most of our main shapes in our scene, now it's time to start refining some of them. So those large buttons and knobs we created on our CB radio, they are just low poly blocked out cylinders at the moment. So we just want to refine them a little bit to make them look more accurate to our reference photo. Now it is important to keep it low in polys since this is our low poly model that we're working on. So I don't want to start smoothing everything out and adding all these bevels. I just want them to look more like knobs and switches rather than just simple cylinders. So let's go ahead and start working on these shapes and we can block them out to look a little bit more like our reference. Now, if you did need it in even lower polys, there is lots you can do. And we will go over that later on in the video as well. But you can start with lower poly cylinders for all those buttons. When I created those cylinders, they're a little bit high in polys. So I could have definitely reduced those to have a lower poly button to work with from the start. I also could have simplified the screws without adding the details. We could just add those details directly into the materials. And there's lots of other stuff we could have do to reduce the polys further if we really needed it. So keep that in mind when you're creating your models for video games. And like I said, we'll go over that more later on in the video. So we're going to continue blocking out the main shapes without adding bevels or smaller details. We want to keep this relatively low in polys. And then afterwards, we can create our higher mesh with all the bevels and all that smooth curvature and everything. All right, so next on the list is that small handheld radio. Now this one's pretty straightforward. All I decided to do was start off with a small cube and then we can roughly block out what that shape looks like. Now, unfortunately, if you look at our Amazon ad and those pictures we're using as reference, there isn't anything telling me the exact proportions or measurements of the size of this radio. And there's no orthographic image that we can use as an image plane to actually model it off of. So what we're gonna do is basically use it as a visual reference like we do a lot on this channel and just kind of guess those proportions and wing it kind of along the way. Now it's important to keep the shape in low polys. We will create a higher poly mesh later on where we can bevel everything and create that nice smooth curvature for our textures. But for now, it's important to keep things nice and blocked out. Now for the area behind those buttons on the radio where it's like Boolean, there's a nice indent, I decided to add a small Boolean. Now we could have faked that and I wanted to make a note that you don't have to add a Boolean if you have to, if you're really trying to cut back on polys or this radio is barely going to be in view. There's no point adding that extra geometry if you don't have to. But since it's going to be fairly close to the camera, I thought adding a nice Boolean there would just make it look that much better. And of course, once that Boolean is created, don't forget to go in with that target well tool and the multi-cut tool to attach all of those vertices and clean everything up. 
And the main reason for that is I just want to be able to give a nice bevel to these edges later on for our high poly mesh. So the better we clean up this low poly mesh, the easier the high poly is going to be to create from. And then, like I said, once that main shape is looking correct, we can go ahead and add a small bevel just on the outside, especially on the top two corners. I just want to round it out a bit so it's not looking so blocked out. And let's not forget about that side button on the side of the radio to actually make it functional. Now, once again, I'm gonna simplify the shape. I'm just gonna be a very small cube. We can add some nice bump to it later on into our materials. Now, if you look at the reference photo, you can see at the end of this wire that connects a handheld device to the actual radio itself, there's those tiny little cylinders. It's like a plastic piece that kind of just sits there. Now we could of course spend a little bit of time modeling this to look a bit more accurate but we are not gonna do that to save time because I don't think you're gonna really notice that detail in those final renders. So we're gonna simplify it. I'm just gonna add in a few cylinders and we can kind of fake it with a few cubes that are crossed in between to make it look like that plastic piece. Now, once again, you can spend more time to make this look more accurate like the reference photo, but I'm just gonna simplify it for the sake of this video. All right, so next up is creating the cord or the wire. And to be honest, this is probably the number one biggest thing that I would reduce polys with if I had to cut back on polys. This is probably more than half of the polys in the scene were just in this wire alone. And there's a few reasons for that. So one, it's a curled helix shape. So it's obviously gonna add lots of polys just because of that shape it is. And also just because of the length. I wanted to make it a little bit longer. That way it just looked cool. Um, but if you really had to cut it back for a video game sake, you could honestly reduce it by half the length and save on half the amount of polys. So I just wanted to put that out there. This is definitely the largest poly thing in the scene. And if it was truly for a video game, I would definitely reduce the length or even simplify it. You can make it just a simple cord that's just like a simple cylinder it doesn't curl around or anything. There's lots of different things you could do if you had to reduce those polys. So how did I make this wire? Well, I first started off by creating a curve tool. So if you go up to create to curve tools, you can create a CV or an EP curve. I enjoy using EP curves for no specific reason, but I decided to use an EP curve to draw out whatever line in the shape that I wanted my core to be. Now this curve is gonna represent our wire. So we can go ahead and modify this curve to shape it in however we want it to look. So we can right click that curve and go over to control vertex and you can select each vertex and start bending and moving them around in your scene. So once that curve is all set, we need to create our helix shape, the main shape of our chord. So to do that, we're gonna go up to create, go to polygon primitive and we're gonna select helix. Now I messed around with the settings of the helix, depending on how thick you want that cord to be. Now you can obviously edit this afterwards as well. So it's not set in stone right off the bat, but it's nice to modify it to look roughly in the shape and the length that you're hoping you want it to look like. And you'll see throughout this video, I jump back and forth to make that length a little bit longer because I wanted the curly part of that wire to be a little bit longer in length. So you just have to mess around with it a little bit until you get into a place that you're happy with. So next we just need to actually attach our helix shape to the curve itself. So to do this, we're gonna first select the curve and then we're going to select the helix second. And I can go up to the very top tab and change it from modeling to animation. We're then gonna go over to constrain to motion paths and we're gonna to attach to motion path options, a little square in the very far right corner. We're actually gonna press the button, we're gonna select the option. And then we can go ahead and make sure that the front axis is set to Y and the up axis is set to X. And then you can press attach. Now you want to go up to your timeline slider so you can go up to windows ui elements and check on timeline slider that we can get the animation timeline slider on the bottom of your page once you click attach you can drag your slider and you'll see that your helix is following the shape of that curve 
Now, of course, it's going to look very messed up and we just need to do a few small things before it's all finalized and looking correct. So next, we just need to select that helix shape, go up to constrain and we can go down to flow path object. And as you see, it'll just set itself a little bit closer to that curve and look a little bit more accurate, but it still won't look completely correct. And that's just simply because we're lacking divisions. So if you go over to your channel box settings, you can find the little shapes, lattice shape node, just like in my video, you can follow along and you can increase the T divisions all the way up to, I set it to 40 or 50, depending on how close you want it to follow your curve that you created. So as long as you have your history on your object and you don't delete any of the history, you'll be able to scrub it around or go all the way back like I do and change the length of your helix and repeat the process and just modify things depending on however you want your core to look. So once I spend a little bit of time kind of going back and forth and just tweaking my core to my helix shape to be a little bit longer, a little bit thinner, just mess around with it until it looked a bit more accurate. We can then just finalize that shape, scrub it down my timeline until I find a position that I'm happy with, and we can go ahead and just continue our modeling. So as you can see, it's just kind of floating right now, not attached to either the remote control, the handheld radio, or the actual radio device itself. So all we're gonna do for this is just start extruding that outside edge. That way I can bend it around and kind of finish off that wire so it connects properly. Now we're not supposed to be actually creating our high poly mesh yet, but it just jumped into my mind how I was actually going to create those small lines, those indents on my handheld radio. So I just quickly started to block out some thin rectangles with beveled rounded edges. And I just duplicated those a bunch of times down in a row to kind of visualize how I wanted this handheld device to look. Now keep in mind, this isn't gonna be on the low poly mesh. This is just gonna be on the high poly mesh. But for some reason, I just jumped in here because my mind just thought of it at the time. So I just really quickly started modeling or thinking about how I would actually create that high poly handheld radio. So really quickly, we're just going to mess around with this one a little bit just to kind of create those booleans where those long little stripes are going to go. Now, once that boolean is created and it's looking pretty good, I do need to go in and clean up the topology a little bit. So I'm going to go in with the target wall tool and the multi-cut tool. I can start attaching some of those empty vertices. And the big reason for this is just because I want to bevel out these edges afterwards to create that nice beveled smooth curvature on my high poly mesh and to do that I do need to fix up my topology otherwise it's just going to blow up everywhere when I smooth it out. So I'm just going to really quickly start attaching some of those vertices together. Alright so the high poly mesh is looking pretty good we're going to come back to it afterwards but we do need to create those buttons as well that sit on the top so that's going to be very straightforward we're just going to create a few cylinders and we can position those on our handheld radio. All right, so we're almost done all of the low poly modeling. Now we just have a few extra things that we need to do before we move on to more fun stuff. Now there's a few objects on the back of this radio that we need to finalize. So I'm just gonna go in really quickly and finish modeling some of these. I took some ideas from various sources just on Google as well as some from our reference that we're using from Amazon. I didn't wanna follow it exactly. The back of the Amazon example was just a little bit more busy and I didn't wanna spend too much time to be honest since I'm trying to get this all done in one day. So we're just gonna simplify these back shapes. So let's go ahead and block out these back objects. Now here, I just wanna jump in and make a quick note. Of course, I added a very small Boolean on the back. That way I can have this button or this little port sitting inside of that back plate. Now you can get away with this just by not adding that boolean and saving on those polys if you have to. You can add like a black circle on your textures that has some height or some bump to it that looks a little bit indented. You can kind of fake where that boolean would be. You really don't have to actually extrude something into your geometry to add those polys. So I just wanted to make a quick note of that. It didn't add too many to the scene, but if you add up all these little things throughout the model, you can definitely come back on a lot if you have to. All right, so the very last object that we are going to add onto our low poly model is a screw. Now, I definitely did not need to add this detail into the actual geometry. We could just fake this very easily by just making a very simple low poly cylinder and then creating that bump or that cross pattern just directly into the mesh. There's no reason for it to be in the geometry. I just wasn't really thinking at this point. Now, just more or less just kind of stuck in this zone of modeling. 
but this is definitely one of the main things besides the cord that I would definitely cut back if I had to reduce polys. All right, and just like that, all of the 3D modeling is complete and we can go ahead and start cleaning up our scene. All right, I lied. There's actually one more thing I wanted to do. And while I was just standing back, zoomed out and looked at the model, I thought, you know what? On the very top corners, because it's very blocked out, we can add a very small bevel. And it's not gonna add many polys to our scene and it's gonna make it look a lot better. So the last minute, I just decided to add one tiny bevel. And all the other bevels on this model, we will get out of our high poly mesh, but this one specific bevel, I just wanted to add. All right, and once I'm happy with the model, I can go ahead and delete all the history. I can start removing any unwanted things that I want in my outliner, like any curves or any things like that, just to clean up our project. And then I can group all of these objects into one group and call it low poly. And of course, we don't want any end gons or anything like that. So really quickly, we're gonna go in with the multi-cut tool. I can just clean up anything that I need before we start the UVing. All right, so let's start some UVs. Now I'm not gonna go over the full UV mapping process. If that's something that you're interested in seeing in real time, it will be part of the video that I upload to my Patreon page, which you can find in the link in the description below. But I did want to include some of the UVing since it is very important. And to be honest, I do the exact same thing for every object in my scene. So I'm just gonna show you a few objects and I basically just repeat the same process for everything else. So all I do here when UVing an object is start off with a camera based projection. And you can find that under the UV tab in camera based. That way I can just remove all of the cuts on the model. And using this 3D cut and sew UV tool, I can go in and start creating cuts wherever I need them. Ideally along edges or on the back of faces where I'm not really gonna see the cuts. And of course, it's really important to straighten your shells whenever you can. So for all of those shells that I can straighten, I'm going to straighten those. Not only is that just going to save me room on my UV map, but it's just gonna make materials look a lot nicer later on in Substance Painter, especially when there's repeating patterns. So once I made all of those cuts on the object, I can go ahead and select all of those UV shells in my UV editor. I can control U to unfold them and then control L to lay them out. Now it doesn't always lay them out correctly, so you will have to rotate your shells to make them fit a little bit better, but I basically just keep repeating this process over and over again. And since all of these UVs are going to be on one texture, I don't need to worry about grouping them up to separate my textures from one another. I can just start slowly just grouping my UV shells aside and then fit them together nicely on my UV editor. So I'll do one more with you in real time. So for this object, for example, I'll go up to UV, down to camera base to remove all the cuts. Using the 3D cut and sew UV tool, I'll double click around those edges and one along the bottom. That way I can unfold them in my UV editor, lay them out, control U, control L, once again, straightening one of those UV shells. And then I can just position those shells off to the side and move on to the next object. And just basically rinse and repeat, obviously duplicating the same objects that are sharing the same UVs. So these knobs will be sharing the exact same UV space. That way I can add that same pattern to one knob and it'll be showing up on the one beside it. Once again, if you want to see the whole UV mapping process in real time, it will be uploaded to my Patreon page. All right, so next up is creating our high poly mesh. Now, this is pretty straightforward. I'm not going to include the whole process. Once again, if you're interested in seeing the full process in real time, that will be uploaded to my Patreon page. But I thought it, since we're basically repeating the same thing over and over again, I just thought it would save a lot of time cutting all that out and just showing you a few of the stuff, the more important things than I did at the beginning. So I first started by just duplicating my low poly model over to create a high poly model. I renamed it high poly, that way I have two models, one folder, one group that's called low poly, and one group that's called high poly. And they're just identical models at this point. So for the high poly mesh, it's really just gonna consist of beveling out all the edges that we have on our low poly mesh. Now not only that, but there is that indent, if you look at our reference photo, it's like a line that's indented across the very front panel of our radio. And I was originally thinking of just adding that directly into the material, which we will still do in Substance Painter. But of course, if I can add that into my high poly mesh, I can just get that nice bump and it will just show, I think, really nicely on our low poly mesh when we use both high and low in our materials later on in Substance Painter. And I think it's gonna bake on that nice line nicely onto our low poly mesh. So to do that, I'm just gonna add some edge loops to start blocking out where that line is. And then I can just simply grab all my faces and extrude them outwards. That way there's a nice indented line. 
Now I need to make sure that my low poly mesh and my high poly mesh are sitting correctly, really close to each other to make this work. So what I'm gonna do after extruding those faces outwards is I'm just gonna select all of my vertices on this whole front panel and I'm just gonna slide them backwards so I can see it aligned perfectly with my low poly mesh. So I'm gonna unhide my low poly mesh from my scene, that way I can see it and I can just pull those vertices back so they align up properly. That way later on in Substance Painter when we do all the baking, it'll just retain that information correctly and show it hopefully nicely on my low poly model. So that's one of the biggest things that I did for my high poly mesh. And of course, besides adding that nice line, that indent, I did Boolean out some holes. So around all my buttons, I just added those Booleans from those original blocked out buttons we created at the very beginning of the video. Since they were already aligned correctly, it made creating those Booleans very easy. I just had to make sure that my actual button was a little bit smaller than my Boolean so it sit inside of it. And then later on in Substance Painter, we can just color all these Boolean holes black. That way, it'll just look like there's some sort of hole there. All right, so here is the high and low poly model in its finished form. Now there are a few small things, basically everything is the exact same, but there is one thing that I decided to do with the high poly mesh. And that was just Boolean out a small hole here. If you look at the reference, there is a hole that's on the side. And of course we can just paint it black, which we will do on our low poly mesh, but I wanted to have that bump there and it just made it easier just adding a nice Boolean into my high poly mesh. And another thing was just this line that goes down the side. So originally in the reference photo, it looks like two metal pieces that are basically kind of attached together. And I wanted just to emphasize that there was a basically a little gap here. So I just took that face and extruded it inwards just to give it a little bit more bump. And we will emphasize that later in Substance Painter by adding, just to press in that gap and make it a little bit more obvious, but we'll do that later on in Substance Painter. But other than that, I just basically took every edge and I smoothed them out. So all of these edges around here added very small bevels to, and I just smoothed them, especially this piece, the handheld radio. And I also added some bevel, some booleans, like I mentioned earlier. So all these buttons are just boolean holes, that way, it just looks more accurate to the real life photo. And one other thing I decided to do is also add some tiny little rivets around this back piece as well as these little screws here on the front. That way I can just see that bump pattern into my low poly mesh whenever we do the baking later on in Substance. But everything else is the exact same. So if I open up my low poly mesh here, Everything is sitting exactly close together, and that's really important. If you're ever noticing that your low poly mesh is for some reason looking very low poly after you do all your baking, it's usually because you have your low poly mesh sitting too far outside, like this one, for example. It should actually be a little bit closer to that high poly mesh. So you could always bring them down a tiny bit. It's a little, a little tip if you're having any trouble that can hopefully solve any weird issues you're having with your high and low poly models. Now if I open up my UV editor, you'll see I just made sure everything was nice and straight, especially these panels on the front, like this one for example, the box, I just wanted to have it nice and straight, and this one especially because we're having those labels, so I just wanted to make sure this was nice and straight in my UV editor. Of course, take advantage of your UV space. I see a lot of people out there that have lots of gaps between these and you're just, you not using up all that real estate. So I just suggest you really take advantage of all your space in your UV editor. And that's basically everything. So what we're gonna do is export one high. I gave, I assigned a material to it and I'm going to export my high poly as well, which is very blown up, but it doesn't matter. We're only using it to bake information. Oh, and also poly count. So I did mention many times in the video how the cord was very high in polys. And I just wanted to show you guys really quickly. Originally, I was trying to aim for like under 10,000 polys for a low poly. And let me just go up here, display, heads up display, poly count. You can see that our low poly mesh is at 18,000 tries, but our cord itself is at 10.6. So without our cord, our model is only at 7,500, which I think is actually pretty reasonable for something like this, considering it has, you know, the screws, the screws we could have easily just put that directly into the material. And, you know, some of these pieces like the screen, for example, which is 176, that could just be literally like 
four polys. <laughs> like, it can be a simple plane, it doesn't have to be that high. So there are things we could have done to definitely reduce it further. But I just wanted to make a note, we did sort of achieve our goal. Um, like I said, this cord, I just wanted to loop around because I just thought it looked cool kind of going around and up top. But if this was for a game, you could easily just kind of bend it around and directly up, cut half of these polys off, which would just definitely bring us more into our target that we were aiming for. So once again, wanted to make a note of that our high poly mesh is 221,000, which is, you know, very high in polys. Obviously, this wouldn't be too realistic for video games. So this is where this high and low poly modeling really comes in handy um, for video games. So I just wanted to show the poly count really quickly just to show you how much of a difference there are between both. So we're gonna export these two meshes from our scene. We can jump over to Substance Painter and we can start our texturing. All right, so now jumping over to Substance Painter, we can go ahead and load in that FBX file from Maya, the low poly model. And once that's loaded in and it's looking correct, we can go up to Mode and go down to Bake Mesh Maps. So we're just gonna go down to the high poly parameters and where you see high definition meshes, we're gonna choose that little file symbol and we can load in that high poly mesh that we exported from Maya. Now for simplicity sake, we're gonna leave everything else to the exact same for settings. We're just gonna go ahead and start baking out our textures. All right, so once that baking is complete, there are a few small things we're gonna do right before we start our texturing. The first one is I'm gonna go up to my shader settings and I'm gonna change my shader to alpha blending. And the main reason for this is because we want to add some more opacity to our model for our screen, I need to add an opacity channel. So by switching this to alpha blending, I can go down to the texture set settings and I can toggle on or add that opacity channel later on in the video. The second thing I'm going to do is change the lighting environment. Right now it's just the panorama, the standard one it comes with. But the problem with that is that it shows a yellow light from the sun source. And that can really change how you view your models because it's getting a yellow light put on the model. So I always like to switch it to a studio light because they just use white lights. That way it's just easier for me to texture my model and later on when we jump into our renderer, hopefully it's not gonna be too drastically different or when we export our materials. And the last thing I'm gonna do is just change the focal length. It automatically comes in very low and since we're going for a more realistic look, I want it to be more of a realistic view from what our eyesight would be. And the closest thing to our eyesight is a focal length of 50. So I'm gonna go ahead and change that number to 50. So as you can see, I already applied a smart material to my mesh and what I always like to do and I say it in all of my videos on this channel is I like to start filling up my meshes with some sort of material. I don't obsess over getting it perfect right off the bat. We can always come back and refine things and I find if you spend too much time refining one material and you start adding in materials around it, a lot of the times, almost every time, that original material will need some tweaking, especially when you see it beside other colors and other materials. So rather than obsessing over getting it perfect right off the start, let's just start filling some stuff in and then we can come back and refine them. So what I decided to go with was a plastic used material, one of the smart materials for my outside shell. Now I always tell people you should really use all of these pre-built materials and substance painter as some sort of foundation or a starting point. They are all fantastic materials and a lot of people feel like you shouldn't use them for some reason and you should build everything from scratch. But you can actually save so much time just by starting with one of these and then refining it. For example, I decided to use a plastic use material and I know the outside shell is not plastic. It's actually more of a metal like material, but I can easily change those by increasing the metallic or reducing that roughness value or by adding different black masks with different grunge and dirt effects over top of them. There's so much stuff you can do to alter that effect and alter that material. So you don't have to think that every material that you see here that's called plastic needs to stay as plastic. You can easily change those depending on however you want them to look. And that's exactly what I did. I decided to use that smart material. It comes with a lot of materials that I know will work well for this specific model. And all I have to do is start turning off some of those channels and those layers that I don't want. And I can start refining some of those layers as well. One of the main ones being the color. So it comes in as a beige. I'm just gonna instantly turn that to more of a black, remove all of that white grunge and dirt all over it. And we can start to build up that grunge ourselves later on. And once I'm happy with it, I can right click, set it to a black mask and assign it to whatever mesh I want in my scene. And I'm basically just going to continue repeating that same process for all the other materials. I'm not going to talk my way through this whole texturing process since it's very repetitive and I basically do the exact same thing over and over again. But I really do this for every model that I texture in. I find it's just a great way to use all these pre-built materials as some sort of foundation and you can start building off of it. 
Now for all the labels I used just pre-built alphas, the only one that I actually Googled was the actual brand, the name of the company. That way I can just have it accurate to what it is on Amazon and I can just paste that as the logo in the top corner. But all the other ones are slightly different. I just used the built-in alphas to save time, but if it really bugged you, you can always create your own in Photoshop and you can drag those in and stamp those onto your mesh. And I also decided to add some stickers. If you're familiar with this channel, I th really throw stickers on everything. I always like to personalize my models by adding in some sort of sticker or give it some sort of backstory. And I thought being a trucker radio, adding some funny trucker stickers would be fitting. So I just Googled those, dragged those in as textures, and I can just paste those directly onto the mesh. And the only other alpha that I actually created myself was the 88. I didn't like any of the numbers and alphas that come with Substance Painter, so I quickly jumped in Photoshop and did exactly that for my 88 number that's on the screen. Every material I'm using in the scene it all comes with Substance Painter. I kept it very straightforward so everybody could follow along. And one thing that I did notice is that this did need a little bit of tweaking at the end just by adjusting colors. I find when I jumped into the renderer, a lot of the times your materials will look a little bit different after you see them actually rendered out in the lighting environment. And I found that happened for that front panel. For some reason, the lighting was playing tricks with me. On some of the Amazon pictures, they were looking more gray. And then when I just scroll through to different images in the same product, they looked a little bit darker. So it just was playing tricks on my mind. I had to kind of go back between both and just modify the colors until I was happy with it. But enough of me rambling on, let's just continue filling up these meshes with materials and we can slowly texture our CB radio.
that is basically everything. That is the whole 3D modeling, UV mapping, and texturing process that I did to create this game-ready CV radio. I really hope you guys enjoyed this week's video. If you did, smash that like button, and don't forget to subscribe to the channel to see more random weekly 3D models. And as always, I want to give a massive thank you to all of my Patreons. You are all amazing, and I really can't thank you enough for all of your continuous support. And if you're interested in seeing this full video in real time, along with the full UV mapping process, or you want to see any of the working files like the FBX model or the Substance Painter file, all of that will be uploaded to my Patreon page as well, which you can find in the link in the description below. Alright, thanks so much for tuning in, and I will catch you guys in the next one.